Well, you guys look uh, super comfortable out there today. I had somebody come up to me before service and said, hey, I thought today was like a special uh, sweatpant Sunday and stuff. And I said, it is. And they said, why do you look like you dress every single week then? I don't, I don't understand. So if you're here today and you're like, man, this is cool wearing pajamas to church, I think that's my way of saying, feel free to do that every Sunday. It doesn't have to just be the first Sunday of the year. Uh, we just wrapped up Christmas season, and I hope you guys all had a, had a fantastic holiday. On the count of three, I just want you to shout out, what was the favorite gift that you gave? Okay, not the favorite gift that you received. What is the favorite gift that you gave? Okay, give you a couple seconds to think about it. On the count of three, just shout it out. One, two, three, go. I didn't hear any new cars uh, being gifted out there, uh, something like that, but uh, no, it, it's super good. Uh, we gifted my son, one, um, uh, we just do a couple gifts, and we gave him a new pair of basketball shoes, and he put them on, and we had this like impending reality, this impending doom or realization, I guess, is that, man, like, maybe it's just our son, maybe it's all uh, seven-year-old boys, but, man, his feet are ginormous. Like they just, he looks like he's got like flippers for feet. He walks like a duck. He runs like a duck. If he just starts quacking, you'd think he's a mallard type of situation. And uh, that went hand in hand with, uh, he has this thing called Dribble Up. He got it last Christmas, which is this app with the yellow basketball, helps you develop your dribbling skills. And so he got these new shoes. We, we laced them up for him and I'm sitting on the couch and he comes up to me all serious and he says, hey, hey dad. I was thinking about something. I was like, yeah, what's up, bud? And so we just finished watching some basketball on Christmas Day. And, uh, and, and he says, it would have been really cool if you were in the NBA at one point. And I looked at him. I said, how do you know I wasn't in, in the NBA before you were born? And he literally just laughed and walked away. <laughs> A couple minutes later, he comes back up the stairs and he goes, hey, dad, do you think I could be in the NBA someday? And I said, well, you come from some pretty awesome genetics. So uh, I said, well, no, actually, I said the exact opposite. I said, you come from a short white family. You know, like you're just kind of out of luck. But I did say, you know, uh, you know, buddy, like, dude, like one of the things to think about, though, is if you ever want to be good at anything, you, you have to love it more than anything else. You have to have this affection, this love for the game. And he says, so like, like doing my dribble up like every single day. If I set my alarm at 5 a.m. and got up every single day, like, let's try like 7, 5 is, you know, maybe a little too early for the ball. And so he, he began to, this, this idea uh, that, that he just knew that, hey, a new year is coming, a new year is starting, and it's a great chance to try to instill something new. You know, today is the last day of, of 2023. Maybe you're a New Year's resolution person. Maybe you're just a word of the year type person. One of my favorite parts of this time of the year is seeing what people come up with uh, in New Year's resolutions. And so, so this one guy took to Twitter, this is from a couple years ago, but this one still always rings in my head. And he said this, my, my New Year's resolution is fasting daily between lunch and dinner. I'm going all in. Wish me luck. Because I can join you, join you in on that one. Uh, maybe your reality is more something like this. Uh, my New Year's resolution is to wake up early, be productive, and then me on New Year's Day, just, just snoozing away. Uh, a couple other people kind of shared on Reddit what some of their New Year's resolutions are this year. This guy just said, eat more tacos. I was like, that is an amazing resolution. Show of hands, how many of you want to join in on that one? Just eat more tacos. Uh, this one I thought was fantastic. Be okay with having to make more than one trip from the car to bring in groceries because the human arm can only handle so much. I was like, that's, that's realistic, people. Uh, this one was, uh, this is just, this was great. Uh, when meeting with friends, I resolved to stop telling the same jokes or I just might find new friends. I don't know. We'll see what the year brings. And then for all you healthcare professionals, my sister, being a nurse practitioner, would love this to be everybody's uh, New Year's resolution, just to stop Googling symptoms. I'm always curious, though, of, of why we make these resolutions and, and what's the difference? Well, what's the difference between somebody who can make a resolution and see it through versus somebody who maybe makes it and doesn't even make it until February? One psychologist said this about New Year's resolutions on why they typically fail. says that chances are the resolution is because of something we've gotten complacent or apathetic towards in our everyday lives, whether that's our diet, exercise, self-care, etc. And we forget to consider that something must change internally in order for it to stick and for it to change what we truly desire. 
AKA it's saying that most resolutions are external things around us, but we need to kick that apathy to the curb in order for it to take place. And one of the biggest New Year's resolutions, you might be here this morning because your New Year's resolution is to start attending church or, or attend church more frequently or, or your desire is to learn more about God this year. And the Barna Group released a study talking about the importance of not just church attendance, but discipleship communities, discipleship relationships. And they they kind of broke it down. This is a great article. You can find it online. But they they have this whole entire chart that said that about only 28% of people who regularly attend church are in some sort of discipleship community. And what that means is it's not just attending church, it's having a close group of people in your life helping you know, follow, discern the will of God better. And my guess is because you're here this morning, you at least desire to know more about God. I would say most of us would probably say, I would love to discern and hear the voice of God more distinct in this year, but only 28% of people are in that type of discipleship community where they have head knowledge, heart change, helpful accountability going round and around and around. But the study went on to say that that 28% who are in those discipleship communities have stated they have increased joy. They have increased sense of importance with their life. They live with a greater peace of the world around them. They sense a kingdom value in all that they do. And then he closes with this. He says, the thing is, is the awareness of Jesus and church has led people to just that. Being aware if they desire it, but few actually long for it. I thought that was powerful. And so when we talk about this morning, we're wrapping up this unexpected series. I want to kind of plant this thought into your mind. That throughout your week, throughout your month, throughout your year, you are familiar with a lot of different things. You have grown accustomed to, you spend a lot of time doing a variety of things with your life. And that idea of familiarity breeds one of three things for us oftentimes. That familiarity can either lead us to awareness. It's there, it's out there. If I need it, I know where to find it, but I don't really long for it. Familiarity can lead us to apathy. Been there done that, heard that, another one of the, and we just kind of begin to zone it out. Things become white noise, or it can lead to affection. That the more you are around somebody or something, your heart begins to long for it. Because as human beings, we are naturally created to be, in some way or another, what we most consistently do what we must consistently think and desire. And so if you have a Bible, I hope you do, uh, I invite you to join me in Luke chapter 2 this morning. We're wrapping up this unexpected Christmas series, Luke chapter 2, and we're, we're coming in on this story on the back side of the birth narrative of Jesus. And the kind of little context for you as you're turning there, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the four Gospels, first four books of the New Testament, um, give us the biography of the life of Jesus, Old Testament pointing us to the arrival uh, of, of our Savior. But Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 22, it, it gives this story of the first 40 days after the birth of Jesus. Because Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, were good, God-fearing, God-honoring Jews. They had 40 days to do some things. The first thing that they had to do is there had to be a burnt offering of a lamb as a, as a cleansing offering. Because of all, all the blood and all that type of stuff, it was an offering they had to do. And then there was also a sin offering of two doves, two turtle doves or two pigeons that had to be offered. It's called a sin offering on, on behalf of the mother. I think that's my way of saying that Mary probably chose some choice words while giving birth that are understandable. And now they got to atone for those sins. And then there is the circumcision that had to happen on the eighth day. And so that whole component, all those things had to happen in the first 40 days of the the child's life. And so they head to the temple. And I want you to think about this. I want you to keep this in mind. Remember, at this point, it's still somewhat just a rumor. At this point, Mary has been telling people for nine months that she's pregnant with the Holy Spirit's child. For nine months, it's probably been spread around and around and around. Can you believe Joseph? Not only does he sleep with his wife before they're married, now he's telling her to cover it up. Like nobody's probably buying this story. Jesus is born, the angels descend, they speak to the shepherds, the shepherds begin to share, but again, we're still just a couple weeks into the life of this child, and this is where we pick up today. Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 22, you can follow along uh, with me 
this morning. It says, when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. On the count of three, say Simeon. One, two, three. Simeon. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, the hope of redemption that is to come. And the Holy Spirit, if you have a Bible with you, underline, circle every single time you see the phrase Holy Spirit here in this text. The Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by, there it is again, the Holy Spirit, that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, there it is again, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and he praised God saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may dis- now dismiss your servant in peace. He's like, it's cool, I can die now in peace, we're all good. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in sight for all the nations, and a light for revelation to the Gentiles, the glory of your people, Israel. Some big, some big stuff there. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Enter stage left. There was also a prophetess by the name of Anna. On the count of three, say Anna. One, two, three. Anna the daughter of Peniel from the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until now. She she, she was 84. She never left the temple, but she worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So here we have two narratives of people, if you think about the entire point of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, a biography of the life of Jesus. And and Luke is is a doctor. He was somebody who was keen on details. So so his Gospel, the Gospel of Luke, has the most details about the life, the comings, the goings, gives a lot of numbers, gives a lot of specifics. And here he finds it vitally important to include the stories of these two characters, these two people, that if you just erase those out of the Gospel of Luke, if they were never mentioned, the story of Jesus goes on. Not a single beat is missed. Nobody ever thinks twice about who they were. And so there must be something about Simeon and Anna in which Luke is saying you need to pay attention They are seemingly in the background. They are people who nobody would really have taken notice, but there was something special about them. And I believe Luke is saying, notice their affection for Jesus. And so here we have Simeon. He's the first one mentioned. It says, he was old, he was devout and righteous, which means he was in good standing before God, good standing before his community. He was a Jewish man. Since he was old, he would have had a long gray beard. So here we have an old man around the time of Christmas with a long gray beard who wants to hold a baby. Sound familiar? And he has been walking with the Holy Spirit so tight-knit that the Spirit makes this promise. Simeon, it's God. And he's like, yo, what up? I hear your heart's desire that of all the things you want to experience in this life, it's not fame, it's not fortune, your one true heart's desire is to see my Savior, your Messiah in the flesh. And seems like, yeah, that's, that's, that's my bucket list. Like you think about it like the, the concept, the notion of a bucket list. Top five things that they say the average person's bucket list. Number one is to see the Northern Lights or the Grand Canyon specifically for Americans. Anybody ever been to the Grand Canyon? Anybody see the Northern Lights before, right? Pretty outstanding. Number two is to get a tattoo. And so it's not just a requirement to get on our staff apparently. It's a big bucket list item for a lot of you guys. Number three is to uh, is either go on a, a cruise or a safari, one of the two. 
Uh, one of them's slightly different than the other, I feel like. Number four is to go skydiving. And number five is to swim with the dolphins. So I said, well, you can just skydive into swimming with the dolphins. You finish two off right before your, your last breath. Pretty easy, right? And you think of the concept of a bucket list. These are the things I want to do. This is what I want to accomplish. This is how I will know I live my life well. Your bucket list might have different things. I want to be influential. I want to have a certain square footage. I want to have a 401k that reaches a certain number. I want to have certain letters at the end of my name. And that's when I will know I have achieved what my life goal is. And Simeon says, my one dying wish in life is not to be rich, famous, influential, have children. My one dying wish is to hold the Savior in my own arms. And so in walk Mary and Joseph and the spirit whispers to him, that's him. That's the one you've been hoping for. See, this wasn't a man who was just aware of their prophecies. This isn't a man who grew apathetic of decades after decades of going to church, hopefully waiting and nothing coming. He was constant and consistent in his affection for the savior of the world. So that's Simeon. On the other hand, we have, we have Anna. Anna's name means favor. So she was a prophetess, meaning she was somebody that people went to when they wanted to know about the things of God. It says she spent decades at the temple. Decades. She was 80 plus years old, maybe well over into her hundreds, and she never left the temple. So she got married probably as a late or young teenager, uh, was widowed seven years, and then never left the temple. Day and night, fasting, day after day after day, praying day and night, day after day after day. And it's interesting because her name means favor. And we think about Anna's life, and I think a lot of people might say, What's so favorable about this life? You were widowed at a young age. You never remarried. You never had a career. You never left church. I mean, it's like, cool, like, I like church, but I go home. You know what I mean? And a lot of people are like, like, like Anna, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Nobody would crave your life. Nobody would, would truly say that is somebody whose life has been favored. Look at Anna the prophetess. Yeah, she knows a lot about God, but man, she really didn't do anything. And if you were to speak to Anna face to face, if you were to ask her her opinion, she would say the exact opposite. She would say, oh, what a favorable life I've lived. To know the voice of God, to be with him day and night, for him to never leave my side, and I am doing my best to never leave his. I have lived a favorable life because my life has been full of my Savior. It reminds me of the words that the Apostle Paul writes in Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. I count everything as rubbish because of the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus. Theologian John Piper puts it this way in his book, Don't Waste Your Life. He says, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in him. You have Simeon, you have Anna, kind of people from the outside looking in are probably a little skeptical of what they've been doing with their life for the recent decades. Are you really buying this this baby's story? Are you really believing this whole thing that this child is somehow, do you know where he was born? Are you aware of who his parents are? He's not royal in any way, shape, or form. They're not wealthy. Are you really expecting us to believe that you have committed your life and this is the conclusion you've come to. That this child, that this child is what everything is about. You can see someone, I mean, how did you actually know, right? Like Jesus wasn't in like a golden fleece diaper. He didn't have like a certain scar on his forehead that signified that he was the chosen one or anything like that. He knew because he was in step with the Spirit. He had an affection for the things of God. And after Simeon has raised this child, kind of like Rafiki does to Simba, the circle of life. No. And Anna sees this out of the corner of her eye. And she knows the thoughts and the hearts and how in step with the Spirit Simeon is. And she's like, he's it too. I know it. I have waited 
decades. I have worshipped him in name, in spirit, in truth, in grace, and he has arrived. Because one of the most beautiful things, one of the details about Anna's life is when when it says to us, not just what her name was, but she was the daughter of Peniel. If you were to go back to Genesis chapter 32, when Jacob wrestles with an angel trying to discern God and he walks with a, with a limp in his leg from that day forward and he gets up and he names that spot Peniel because I saw God face to face. Anna's whole life was built around this idea of encountering God face to face. And so when others think you're crazy, when others think you're weird, when others might be a little skeptical, might think you're a little off, just plain different because of how passionately you hopefully pursue the God of the universe. What keeps you going is not just being aware of the things of church. It isn't just knowing that the Bible is real and exists. What keeps you going has to be something deeper that decade after decade after decade, doing the same thing over and 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 a lot of us would grow tired and weary. We would give up. We'd say, we haven't received this good news yet. For 80 years, I've been praying and fasting and nothing's changed about my situation here on earth. But my love has deepened for the Savior of the world like never before. See, that's what a faith that matters looks like, is having a a deep affection for Jesus above all else. So you have Simeon, you have Anna, who were so familiar with not just the prophecies and the word of God, They were so familiar, not just with the things of the temple, they were familiar with God himself that it did not lead them to apathy. It did not just develop an awareness. It led them to affection. And the rest of the world is looking in on them saying, that's what you want your life to be known about. And they both abundantly, resoundingly say, absolutely. So it's my question for you today. Is how would you measure a life well spent. All said and done, how would you measure for yourself, for those around you, perhaps even for your own family, how would you measure a life well spent? You know, uh, my wife and I have been to, together for, oh gosh, math. 14, 15 years now, something like that. I don't know, somewhere around there. 15 years. And our first date, I'll tell you about our first date. Like, I was a super awkward person, still kind of am. Some of you are like, okay, tell us something we don't know. That's cool. Um, And so, like, I saw her, the way we met, some of you guys know this story, is I hit her in the face with a dodgeball. Uh, So we were playing dodgeball. It was, like, second day of school. I was trying to peg my friend somewhere. And uh, he ducks and moves out of the way. And my wife, since she's really short, is just, like, running in the background and just straight in the face. And then I was like, oh, sorry. And I was like, oh, she's kind of cute. So I go up to her and I said, like, can I walk you back to your dorm, blah, blah, blah. And we get to talking. And then, like, I finally build up the courage, like, two months later to ask her out. Now, I had not really dated, like, one or two people at this point. And so just kind of, like, just, like, an uncomfortable situation for me. And so, like, I give her these note cards of, like, where do you want to open this note card? It'll be a surprise, blah, blah, blah. In, in actuality, they all just led to the same place. Like, I didn't want to actually be caught off guard. Um, and so we went to the macaroni grill because it's one of her favorite. Had a great time. Talked uh, for a couple hours. Uh, we hit it off. So we're pulling back up to the dorm. And I, so I pull up to the front of our dorm. I'm like, okay, see you later. And I reach over and I give her a fist bump. And then she walks out and walks into her dorm. That was how our first date ended, straight up. And the thing is, is people could probably be like, that's kind of sad. <laughs> Poor guy. I was like, no, like, that's just the way it is. But year after year after year, week after week, month after month, the familiarity between one another has developed into a, a deep affection. That started surface level, that started with a fist bump, has led to an amazing relationship, a full life, a full family together. 
You see, there's a difference between knowing about someone or something and knowing someone or something. There's a monumental difference between knowing the facts about a player and having shared the court with them. There's an astronomical difference of being able to say what somebody likes and doesn't like and what sets them off, what doesn't set them off, how they take their coffee in the morning or not, and knowing what truly makes that person tick, what their fears, their dreams, what is deep resonating within their soul. And so in order to become familiar with somebody or something, and I'm going to encourage you to view this as to become familiar with Jesus, there has to be a frequency. You can't begin a relationship with somebody and show up once a month, every six weeks, every so often when the schedule lines up and hope to have an intimate relationship. Familiarity requires frequency. But there also must be a devotion, a discipline that Simeon and Anna both had that led to a discovery of who the Messiah was. And the amazing thing about the Christian faith for you and I is that it's made available to each and every one of us. Jesus doesn't reserve his best stuff. Jesus doesn't say you got to reach this certain spot, this certain pinnacle. You have to go to, to this certain school for long enough in order to hear from me. He doesn't say that that you got to put in enough dues first before I will love you, care for you, shepherd you, show my grace for you. But is it reciprocated back around? And I think the difference between Anna and Simeon, perhaps the people who were in the temple worshiping, who didn't recognize Jesus as Savior, was probably where they placed their time. Here's my point. My main point for us this morning is the difference between apathy and affection is not desire, rather direction. That's pretty good. It rhymes. Come on, people. Had to give you one star off the bank. The difference between apathy and affection, it's not desire. It's direction. What are you looking towards? What's the spot that you're placing your time, your energy, your effort How are you investing you, so to speak? How are you determining what you value, what you are chasing after? I'd venture to guess since you're here this morning, you at least have some sort of desire to know God, to worship God, to seek God. But is the direction there when you take a step back and look at your life? We all have time. It's the greatest currency gifted to every human on this planet. The thing is we don't have time to waste. You think about the difference between a master and an apprentice or a master and a spectator in life isn't the capability. And sometimes there's supernatural ability or stuff that they're just born with, but chances are they just worked a little bit harder. They were more consistent and constant of what they wanted to see happen. If I put you on a putting green with this ball and a golf club, you could put this into the hole. If I put you 10 feet away, you are capable of putting this into the hole.
take these hobbies and things away and put in something maybe a little bit more you. Consider this, this keyboard your job. Consider your workplace, your career. There's other people that can probably do your job. There's other people that might be able to do your job better than you. And you might be fully invested, consistently trying to raise that to the next level. But just kind of sitting and showing up ain't going to cut it. That if you really want to see something, go from the place of just being an apprentice to a master, somebody who knows about to knowing it. It has to be consistent and constant. And so here's my my recommendation, my point, my suggestion. If you're here this morning and your New Year's resolution or a thought or a yearning of your heart is I want to be able to worship God like Simeon. I want to know the voice of God like he did. I want to walk in step with the Spirit like Simeon did. I want to spend night and day in love with Jesus. I want to wrestle with him in a way so that I can proudly say, I am of the tribe of Peniel. I have seen him face to face. The question is, it comes down to this. Are you consistently, constantly here? Are you consistently, constantly in his word? Are you consistently, constantly praying, fasting, worshiping, serving, giving? Because at the end of the day, at the end of your life, how would you answer that question? What is a life well spent to you? One of the greatest pieces of advice I've ever received, received it in middle school, in eighth grade. And it was this line, they say, write your eulogy, then live to fulfill it. So if I were to ask you, how do you want to designate, measure a life well spent? What might be on that bucket list? Is it to be somebody loving, somebody caring, somebody successful? Is it to be somebody who knows Jesus, understands the voice of God? And our hope, our desire for you as a church is that every single one of us aren't just aware that Jesus exists. We don't want people who grow apathetic in their faith. We want people to be affectionate for their Savior. But unless there is devotion, unless there is discipline that is consistent and constant, we will never, ever get there. But the beautiful thing is it's capable for us all because of his love and his grace. And so you might be stepping into 2024, looking back on 2023 or or the decade ahead and say, this is going to be the year that's going to be different. This is going to be the year that my faith goes to the next level. This is going to be the year that I take this thing seriously. And I'm here. We're behind you. We support you. We are clapping and cheering you on. But at the end of the moment, I can't do anything for you. And it's got to be consistent and constant. What would 2024 look like? for you as an individual? What would 2024 look like for you as a family? What would 2024 look like for you as a couple, if you're in one? What would 2024 look like for us as a church if we all consistently and constantly strove for our affection of Jesus as our Lord and Savior? We're going to continue to worship through communion this morning. If you are a regular with us or maybe you're just checking things out, um, communion is something we do every single week. You are more than welcome to participate with us if you are a member of the family of God, if you've taken Jesus as your Lord and Savior. My encouragement as the timer gets ready to come on the screen, as you take the elements, the cracker that represents the body of Christ broken for you, the juice that represents the blood of Christ shed for you, give thanks for this year. Give thanks for his goodness. Give thanks for his gospel. Give thanks for his love and his passion, his affection for you. And then spend some time seeking the Spirit, asking for that in return. Seeking, asking the Spirit to love Jesus more this year than ever before. Would you pray with me as we continue to worship our Savior Jesus? Jesus, we thank you that you were affectionate for us to live, to die on a cross, to raise again. Stir our 
deeply for you. In your name we pray.